Good morning. Good to see you today. My name is Peter, one of the pastors here. Uh, welcome to Heart of Life Church. Whether you're here in person, tuning in online at one of our campuses as well, we are grateful to be able to join together in worshiping the famous one, Jesus Christ himself. Well, for the past month, we have been working our way through a series called March Gladness. March Gladness. And each week, we've considered how God desires to grow us in his joy and his gladness. We learn this through delighting in God's presence. That was week one, delighting in God's presence. Week two was walking in God's path. We follow that up by learning to rest in God's promise. That was week three. Week four was discovering God's passion. That is the passion that he gives each of us to live out in his world. And today, we're going to finish up by realizing God's plan. All of this has been God's plan from the beginning. Pa presence, path, promise, passion, and plan. Now, believe it or not, those five Ps did not hit us until halfway through the series. But... Here we are. And in the legendary words, or the words of the legendary Bob Ross, happy little accidents, right? So the plan of, good, of gladness, the plan of gladness, why? Because believe it or not, it's not enough that there is joy found in the presence of God. And it's not enough that there's a path and a promise of joy and gladness. And it's not even enough that we have within each of us a deep well of gladness, this joy-filled passion within us. No, it turns out gladness has been at the heart of God's plan for the whole world since the very beginning. Jeff opened up our series with a wild March Madness stat that the odds of getting a perfect bracket are so rare that you'd be more likely to get struck by lightning, win the lottery, and find a boa constrictor having traveled up the pipes of your toilet all in the same day. But when it comes to Jesus and his plan of gladness, well, the game is rigged. The game is rigged. When Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood on Calvary, what I'm saying is it wasn't a gamble for him. He knew full well that nothing would stop this march of gladness until every corner of the earth was drenched in the glory of his love. That's what we're about to see this morning in Psalm 67. Please turn there with me. Psalm 67. As we read through the seven verses of this psalm right now, I want us to take note of any key words or themes that seem to jump out at you. It begins, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. So that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, still blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Pray with me. Father, you have good things in your word for us today. Wondrous things. Open our eyes to see them. Open our hearts to believe. Open our hands to receive from you that we would live in the light of your glory. Show us the bloodied cross. 
Show us the barren tomb. Show us Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. When I was a kid, I loved telescopes. Binoculars, magnifying glasses, pretty much anything that had the ability to zoom in and zoom out. I was all about that. I just loved being able to, even from far away, get up really close to to see all the intricacies and the the nuances of something and the detail so that when I zoomed out, I could appreciate the whole thing even more. Well, many of you know this, but I grew up on the East Coast. My dad worked in New York City, and so there were times that I would go to the Big Apple with him, and can I tell you, it is really overwhelming being surrounded by so many people. Like everywhere you look in New York City, it's like crowds and crowds and crowds and crowds. So much movement, so much noise, so much chaos, like so many different stories reflected in the different faces of the people that you encounter on the streets. Not to mention the sound of cars, especially taxis, all either honking in a total, you know, traffic gridlock or just whizzing right by you, racing to their destinations. And the buildings, the buildings, the absolute skyscrapers, up close, they're like these giants with their feet planted firmly into the ground. But I remember one time getting to go to the top to the observation deck on top of one of the Twin Towers. This was before that terrible day in 2001 when two planes took them down. But we stood 1,776 feet up in the air. And even though I felt like I was about to die because of how fast the wind was blowing up there, and there's literally this heaving designed into the building so it doesn't fall over. Like this heaving, this, the wind, it's, it's moving slightly this way and that way. I'm telling you, there was something so incredible because I got to stand up top and look and see in front of my eyes all of New York City. Just to take it in at one time, to see the whole panoramic view and the hustle and bustle of it all just kind of slowed down. And I saw the Hudson River the Statue of Liberty, Times Square, just all at once taking it in. And just like it's possible to miss the beauty of the city because of all the noise on the ground, but the moment you go up to the tower and you get to zoom out, you see it all in perspective. Our psalm today is a lot like that too. And what I want us to do is to zoom out and explore our psalm. I want us to, to, really, and to really zoom out and then to zoom back in and see some of the interwoven complexities and nuances that exist. And then we're going to zoom out one more time and do a final scan to see the magnificence of the plan of goodness that, and gladness that God has been up to all along. And so to start, I want to get all the words of the psalm up on the screen. Now, I'm telling you, this is really, you don't need me to tell you, this is really small, right? It's hard to see. So hopefully you got a Bible in front of you. But I want you to see these large threads that are going to span the entire set of seven verses. And the only way to do it is to get it up on the screen this way. Now, as I read through the text this week and the last few weeks in preparation, um, a few key words jumped out at me. Perhaps some did for you as well as we looked at it just a moment ago. But there are four Four words that kept circulating through my mind. And the first is this, the word grace. Grace. Verse 1 says, may God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine. See, this word grace is about the heart and character of God. That our God is gracious. He is Uh, It's not just something that he does. This is something that he is. He is good. He is slow to anger. He is filled with compassion and steadfast love. And this thread shows up elsewhere, right? We see it in verse 4. It says he rules with equity. That's about fairness and justice, all in accordance to the character of his love. 
And in verse 6 and 7, we see that he's a God who blesses. Not just who blesses us once, but it says blesses us still. It's a continuous action of God. He just keeps pouring out blessing upon blessing. This is the kind of God that he is. Even when I fail to live up to my, uh, my way of walking under his steps, he still finds a way to bless me. This is who our God is in character. In spite of who I am, he is still a blesser. Then this is the thread of God's grace. And then out of his grace of character, he then acts. He moves, he does, and he works. And that leads us to our second word, the word ways, ways. See, he says here, so that your ways may be known on earth. That's our second word. So God moves, and he moves, as verse 4 says, in two primary ways. He moves in, as he rules, and he moves as he guides. Those are two ways that he acts. He rules and he guides. Think of it this way. To rule is from above, and to guide is from within. God is over us, right? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He is above and beyond us. The fancy theological word for this is the word transcendent. He is transcendent. He transcends. He's not limited by our ways. No, instead, he goes beyond and he reigns over us. And yet, although he's transcendent, he's also imminent. And that means he is among us. He is with us. He is near. He's present. He comes close. And from within, then, he guides us in the way that we are to go as well. Now next, as his perfect ways pour out from his heart of grace, we find a response that wells up and out from within us. And that word is our third word, praise. Praise. Verse 3 says, may the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Seven times in this psalm alone, the word praise or words in relation to that word are used as a response that our gladness and our singing and our joy, even our fear and reverence, all of it is in response to who our God is and what our God does. And this brings us back to the plan that I was mentioning before, that it's never been in the heart of God to keep this all to himself. It's never been in the heart of God that we keep this to ourselves either. No, this gladness is meant to spread to every place. And that is our final word, our fourth key word for the psalm, place. Verse 2 you see that his ways would be known on earth and among all nations, every tribe, every tongue, every place. In just seven verses, six times it says us and our, and eight times it says the peoples or the nations. That's because this is the end result driver. The plan and purpose of all of it is that all people from every nation and every tongue and every generation everywhere would know our God. This is not plan B. This is not some side mission in the game. This is the whole game. We could spell out the progression of God's plan like this. God's grace, God's ways, our praise in every place. From God's heart of grace, he demonstrates his perfect ways, resulting in our praise to God in every place on earth. Right? As Jeff likes to say from time to time, that'll preach. Now watch what happens when you take this color-coded four-keyword system and apply it over the entire psalm. You've got green and blues and yellows and purples, and they're all kind of intermingled together. Now, a couple quick observations. Notice 
that every single verse has at least two different threads represented in it. The themes are never in isolation. They spill over, under, around, and through one another in such a way that it leads to this like beautiful uh, interwoven tapestry. But also notice that of all the verses, one, two, three, four, of all the verses, all seven of them, only one verse, verse four, actually contains all four key words. It says, may the nations, that's place, be glad and sing for joy, that's praise. For you rule and you guide, that's ways, the peoples, the nations, with equity, and that's grace. So all four threads are found right there in verse 4. Now, and that's right at the center of the psalm. And if I can be honest, that feels a little bit strange to me, right? Because you would think that verse 1, like whoever's taking an English class, and the first thing you're supposed to do in the introduction is introduce all the themes that you're about to talk about. So you'd think verse 1 would do it, but it doesn't. Or same English class told me that the conclusion should wrap it all up, and I'm looking at verse 7, and it doesn't have all four of them in there either. What's going on? Why is verse 4 the center, the apex of the entire thing? What's happening? Well, verse 3 and verse 5 gives us a clue. Let me read you verse 3 real quick. It says, may the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. So that's verse 3. Now, what's verse 5? May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. It's the exact same thing. Did the psalmist run out of ideas and just decide I'm just going to repeat myself? What's happening here? The psalmist is drawing our attention to the focal point of the entire psalm. And it's not verse 1 and it's not verse 7. The culmination, the climax is verse 4. He's drawing our attention there on purpose because Psalm 67 is not an essay. It's not a, a story. It's not a doctrinal statement per se. It's actually a song. And as a song, it's poetry. And what the writer is doing is he's utilizing a literary form, a traditional literary form in Hebrew known as a chiastic structure. Chiastic structure. We got verses one, two, three, four, five, six, seven happening right here. Now there's a lot going on in this diagram. I'm just going to draw your attention to a couple things. And really, this is just scratching the surface. But verse four is the center. And from the center pours out everything that's happening. From the center, it's both the fountain from which everything springs and it's the place in which it all draws its attention back. And it's the high point, right? You follow from one to seven. And it's the high point. It is the apex of it. It is the goal of the whole thing. Verse 4, right in the middle. But here's what's interesting. If you were to, here's a dotted line. If you were to fold the psalm in half on verse 4, if you folded it in half, well, verse 3 and 5 would perfectly match one another. And then verses 1 and 2 and 6 and 7 would fall on top of each other because they're meant to nuance and interpret one another and give greater beauty to the whole thing and shed light on one another. You also notice that the threads, right? So here, uh, yellow, yellow was the ways of God. Well, it's showing in verse 1 and it's showing in verse 6. It's showing in verse 2 and it's showing in verse 4. And you've got the praise, right, happening here from verse 1. And it's all this interconnectedness. And it's, it's really interesting to, to stare at it and to see the interplay that's happening here in the psalm. Like if you were writing a song, if Tomlin were to write a song today on this psalm, Chances are verses 1 and 2 and verses 6 and 7 would be the verses of the song, right? It's like they're, they're important, but they're not the most important. And then verse 3 and verse 5, the may the people's praise you, would probably be the pre-chorus. It would be the part of the song where it repeats a little bit. But the chorus, the hook, the thing that's all, the whole song is about verse 4. The whole chorus would be, may the nations be glad. May they sing for joy as God rules and God reigns the whole world in accordance to his love. Because that's the goal. 
That's the focus and the plan of redemption. God making the world right again under his rule and his reign. And the result in every place would be gladness and joy. Now, maybe you want to take a picture of this and study it on your own and kind of see and analyze it for yourself. Because maybe you're like me and you're like, wow, this is, this is like really cool. I love digging into this stuff and, and analyzing it and just seeing what comes up. Or maybe, ironically, you're also like me and you're kind of listening and you're like, okay, this is cool and interesting. But like, what's the point? Right? If we're not careful, we can do unintentionally with the Bible what the writer of Charlotte's Web, E.B. White, said we do with humor sometimes. He said, explaining a joke is a lot like dissecting a frog. You learn a lot in the process, but you end up killing it in the end. And the same can be said about the scriptures. Because sometimes we get so caught up in the process of knowing about God that we inadvertently miss the chance to truly know him. I think it would do us well to pause. We've zoomed in enough. Let's zoom out a little bit. And having seen all that we've seen so far, I want us to zoom out and take this all in as it was meant to be taken in as a song. Because that's what it was, a song. And so I'm going to take a moment. I want to sing a song for you uh, based on this psalm. And I want us to let all the complexities and the nuances of everything that we've seen so far, I want us to just let that soak as we hear these words and, and hear it sung. And then from there, let's just praise our God. So, so give a listen to this. gracious to us and make his face shine on us so your ways are known on earth and your salvation among every nation may all people praise you may all people praise you may all people praise you, God, till the nations are glad and sing for joy as you rule this whole world to love. May the nations be glad and sing for joy as you guide this whole world. Still blesses, oh God, still come to bless us till all places will sing of your greatness. May the people praise you, may all people praise you, may all people praise you, God, till the name are glad and sing for joy as you guide this whole world to love. May the nations be glad and sing for joy as you guide this whole world to love. Till the nations are glad and sing for Be glad and sing for joy as you guide this whole world to love. Ah, amen. Ah, amen. Ah, amen. Ah,
God's grace, God's ways, our praise in every place. From God's heart of grace flows his perfect ways and it results in gladness and praise throughout the entire world, even to the ends of the earth. And this actually brings us then all the way back centuries later to the very portion, the passage that we've been looking at all series long, Acts chapter 2. Because when the Apostle Peter stood up that day on Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he stood to proclaim the gospel, do you remember what happened? The Holy Spirit... Just as Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit descended and with the Spirit came great tongues of fire. So that all who had gathered from every corner of the earth in that moment, they heard the gospel and it says they heard it within their own language. God's grace, God's ways, our praise in every place. It's like when Jesus met that Samaritan woman at the well, John chapter 4, and when she found him to be the spring of living water that day, it says she left her water pot behind. She didn't need it anymore. And she ran back home to Samaria to tell her hometown about him. Why? God's grace, God's ways, our praise in every place. And in Acts chapter 1, just one chapter before the story of Acts chapter 2, when Jesus ascended into heaven, where he is now seated in power at the right hand of God the Father, Jesus gave a final charge to his earliest followers that they would be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of what? The earth. God's grace, God's ways, our praise in every place. This has always been the plan. It was the plan when God created Adam and Eve, charging them to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. It was the plan when God called a man named Abraham, declaring that through his family, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It was the plan when God freed his people Israel from bondage in Egypt and set them up in their own land, that they would be a kingdom of priests to God and a holy nation. Why? So they could be isolated from the world? No. So that when the world would come by, they would see the glory and grandeur of God and that they would stand in the gap imaging to the world the ways and the heart of God. And this is still the plan of God that he is bringing about through Jesus Christ as he gathers to himself a church. That as the Acts 2 preacher Peter himself would say in one of his letters follows the same arc that we would be now a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God's special possession that we would declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This has always been God's plan. His grace, his ways, and our play, praise in every place as all humanity gathered under the one name of Jesus Christ would join in the glad song of the redeemed, for he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And I experienced this firsthand back in 2019. My wife Grace and I had the joy of visiting Israel with several other pastors and spouses. And at each of the sites, different ones, uh, different ones of us would actually share a little devotional thought for the, for, the, for the space. And one of the most impactful places for us was a place, no, it was actually a door of Simon the Tanner's house. Here we are standing outside the door of Simon the Tanner. And Simon the Tanner, you can read his, about the story in Acts chapter 10. But basically, here's what happens. The apostle Peter is on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner's house. 
And it's there that God gives him a vision. A vision that the gospel was meant not just for the Jews, but for all the world. And what was so impactful was that the pastor asked asked one simple question. As we're all standing there, gathered around, he says this. Who here is Jewish? Raise your hand. And no hands went up that day. Because each of us had come from other places, other lands, other countries, other nations. And then he goes, God's plan worked. Grace shared about this experience one time in a blog post a couple years ago. And I love how she phrased it. So I want to close by relaying her words about that moment. She says, before that day, I took my faith for granted. It had been passed down to me through generations in my family. It was my right to be given the hope of God, right? My parents believed, their parents, their parents, and so on. What our dear pastor friend reminded us at that door was that we, from America, ambassadors for the hope of promise given by our Lord, only received the gospel in the first place because God's plan was for all people from the beginning of time. She says, I'm not Jewish. Had God not had Gentile non-Jews in mind when Jesus lived sinlessly, suffered, died, and rose again, I would not have been on a trip to Israel as a pastor's wife, born and raised in America 2,000 years after the vision God gave the apostle Peter. Send the gospel out. And out it went. It has stood the test of time, test of thousands of years, numerous cultures, nations, governments, languages, no matter who you are, what you have done or where you have been or how you have succeeded or failed, regardless of your spiritual understanding or background, this gospel has come to your front door. Because it is for all. God's grace, God's ways, our praise in every place. My friends, his plan has worked. It's worked and it's working still. We are the proof of it. So what is keeping us then from joining in the march of gladness. For some of you, it's time to believe in Jesus. It's time to make that choice. The gospel has traveled far, has traveled too far for too long, been suffered for and died for too long for us to just stay here wondering whether or not God loves us really. Can I tell you, He has loved you since the beginning and God loves you now. Will you trust him? Will you in your heart turn to him and say, Lord, I believe. And for others of us here, maybe it's time not to believe for the first time, but it's time to live like you believe. It's time to join the March of Gladness and spread the name and fame of Jesus. Because going to the nations may look like hopping on a plane and going to Taiwan like some of us just did. And going to the nations may also look like hopping over the fence and talking to that neighbor of yours. Because the ends of the earth are here too. The fact that we as Americans believe at all is evidence of the work that has been fulfilled since the beginning. It is time to join the mission and become part of the plan of God as it continues to unfold. And so we're going to sing in a moment. And the band's going to invite us to sing a song about carrying the gospel. That we get to carry the gospel to every place that we go. From the ends of the earth to the ends of our driveways. And so whether you are here and you are ready to believe 
or you are here and you are ready to live like you do, may this song be a commissioning song for each one of us today. That God would send us out into his fields which are ripe and ready for the harvest. And that we would be readied to spread the joy and the gladness that we have found in Jesus Christ. And that we would find God's plan continuing to unfold as we continue with every step to take the gospel with us. That his glory would spread like wildfire across our homes, across our streets, across our neighborhoods and across our cities and our, and, our, and our country. Lord, that you would make your gladness known because you are good and you reign and you guide and you provide. My friends, God loves you. He loves us all. And so let us join in the march of gladness and show his love to the whole world together. Let's stand together and sing to carry the gospel.